Hello and welcome to Maths on the Move, the podcast from plus.maths.org. I'm Rachel Thomas. To celebrate the Commonwealth Games happening this week in the UK, we're going to visit one of the venues, the Velodrome in the Lee Valley Velo Park in London. The Velodrome, with its striking curved shape, was built for the London 2012 Olympics. In the run-up to those Olympics, we talked to structural engineers Andrew Weir and Pete Winslow from Expedition Engineering about how mathematics helped create this iconic shape. We hope you enjoy revisiting our conversation with Andrew and Pete and we wish good luck to all the athletes competing in the 2022 Commonwealth Games. During the Games, all eyes will be on the curled ribbon of wooden track at the centre of the velodrome, designed by world-famous track designer Ron Webb. The track, like all velodrome racing tracks, consists of two long, flat straights linked by two steeply banked turns at either end. The turns are built at such a steep angle in order that the cyclists can circle the track at high speeds, reaching more than 50 kilometres per hour. Andrew Weir and Pete Winslow's job, along with their colleagues at Hopkins Architects, was to design the building that housed it. And although they couldn't tell us anything about the exact geometry of the track, which is top secret, they could tell us that it didn't have the usual reflective symmetry that you usually find in buildings. If you folded the track in half lengthwise, for example, the two halves wouldn't match up. Andrew explained, this is because you always cycle the same way around the track, going shallower into turns and steeper out of them. The difference may only be a matter of 10 to 20 centimetres before and after the turns, but it does have implications for the structure surrounding the track. The difference in height means that the seating, so where we arrange the seating around, then that bit of the building behind isn't symmetrical. But obviously as as far as to make a building efficient, you try and get back to symmetry as as much as possible. So within a couple of rows back from the front seat, we've got back to symmetry. It's surprising to realise that the team didn't have the final eye-catching shape of the building in mind when they began the project. Instead, they designed the building from the inside out, using a mathematical technique called parametric modelling, so that they could focus on the needs of the spectators and competitors using the velodrome to define its final shape. Because one of the key things on any, any sporting venue is basically, is basically how good the site lines are. There are ways of measuring sight lines that it's really effectively what you see over your eye, um, over the head of the person below. So very steep terraces are very good in that you can, you know, you, the person below is a lot, a lot further down below you. But the problem is there's access issues that you, you can only go up a certain staircase so, inclination. Pete Winslow explains how parametric modelling differs from the traditional approach. It be very good drawing. So traditionally is the same... If you draw, you draw the same way as you draw on paper traditionally. You know, you, rather than a pencil and a ruler, of course, you've got a mouse and you can draw straight lines and you can draw a particular item object which has got specific dimensions. Uh, and then after you've drawn it, you then check do we have sight lines, do we have um, the right space for structure and so on. But the parametric model, you don't start off by drawing lines, you start off by saying what are the rules that we need to apply. Um, so actually, you've almost got a blank computer screen, you've got 3D space in your, um, in your software package, and then you, you, you say the rules we need are the seating terraces cannot be greater than a certain uh, angle for, uh, for safety, and every seat needs to have sight lines onto the track. Um, and you can imagine there's a whole bunch of rules you can build up from that. Uh, and then, essentially, uh, there's only a a small number of ways that you can resolve all the rules at the same time and that gives you your, mm. your geometry. Because what we're looking for is fantastic experience for people in the stadium but equally we don't want to build a stadium that's twice as big as you need to. Yeah. We always had this idea that we've really shrunk wrapped the building to the form that's inside so you know that we have to put a track, we have to put 6,000 seats around it, each one of those seats being a nice place to sit. But no, we didn't want to build anything more than that. We didn't want a sort of empty volume that you pay to build, particularly on something like the Olympics when there's obviously budget issues. It was this combination of the shrink-wrapped concept with concentrating on the experience of spectators and cyclists that created the unusual form of the velodrome's roof. Andrew Weir again. If you go back to the track, at the ends it's banked at this 42 degrees, so it's not a particularly good place to sit at the end. 
because you can't look down because the track is actually steeping, um, it's very steep, you don't see what's going on in front of you. And the maximum rake of a seating tier is about 34 degrees. So the more and more seats you put that, the worse it gets because the banks are 42, but they're only at 35. So, the, so at the end is the worst place to sit. But the one bit of feedback we did have from the cyclists is that when they're going around, in a lot of velodrome, you get a lot of you know um, excitement on on the straights. But when you go around the end, it's almost like a deathly silence. Yeah. So what we did is we put a couple of rows of seats around the end, just to sort of release this sort of some continuity of uh, spectators. But the bulk of the six thousand are each side. Now you can imagine that obviously builds up um, sort of volume at the sides, but at the end there's very little. Mm. So you get two high points and two low points. So obviously if you go back to the idea of shrink wrapping it you end up with a roof that's pulled down at the ends and up at the sides. So that, you know, automatically starts giving you a doubly curved surface. And the striking doubly curved roof has the added advantage of being incredibly efficient. If you look at the sort of structural efficiencies, a flat plane is probably the least efficient. Um, then a single curve, so an arch, a barrel vault or something like that is next most efficient. And then the most efficient is a double curved... And you mean roof. efficient in what sense? In, t- in terms of... We would see it as in terms of material you need to put in to span. So if you had a you know, if you had a hundred meter by hundred meter roof, a flat roof is the least efficient. You would need the most amount of structure in it. As a barrel will have the, the next least or next most, and then the double curve. double curve is the most efficient. I mean, effectively, the the, the the curvature plays off against each other. So um, on our roof, we have. So we, we, we have cables hanging down in one direction and, they, and then we have other cables in the other direction. They stress against each other. So one cable really wants to go up and the other cable really wants to go down, which holds it in place. Yeah. So you can use... Um, so in that, in that surface, you can have some uh, basically cables uh, because they're catenaries. They can take the weights. So it's very much like a hanging chain. Yeah. So every little bit of steel on that cable is acting as most efficient. Yeah. And it's because so, the, it's, it efficiently uses the material. If, if, you, if you imagine a chain hanging, yeah. so like the back to sort of Gaudi sort of hanging models, it takes up the, the form it wants to take up. So it, it is nothing, there's no extra sort of internal... So you're not having to force it into that shape, yeah. just that's the shape it's forced so it, I mean, Yeah, and it totally depends on the sort of the loading. So if you've got a chain that's hung a weight off the middle, it would almost go into a V-shape, it would have a slight sack in it. And if you put a constant weight over it, you get then get a catenary. So it takes up the shape it wants, yeah. um, which is, a, as a structural engineer, we call that form finding. So um, it's the process of finding the sort of, it's a minimum energy. It's yeah. usually the, the shape to the least amount of bending. Yeah. Because on a really simple level, you know, if, you, if you look at a, a structure that's flat, that is like a beam or a plate, or a floor that you stand on in every office or school or any building, um, the, the material at the very top of your beam is in compression, the material at the very bottom is in tension, and the material in the middle does very little. Does very little, yeah. So, and if it's not bending in, you, you, all that stuff in the middle is doing not very much. So, you've got to pay for it, you've got to buy it, yeah. and you've got to hold it up, and it's not actually helping you at all. So, <laughs> so you, I mean, it's very much, I mean, you, that's how you get those, you know, if you sort of see the standard building beam, steel beam, it's an eye shape because it's okay. pressure in the material to the top and bottom. The cable net structure used to build the curved roof is incredibly efficient, but using such a flexible structure brings its own complications. Andrew Weir again. If you imagine it like a tennis racket, it sort of, as, as a ball hits a tennis racket, it deflects down, and, it, and you can imagine each little square in the tennis racket will change shape, it deforms a little bit as the whole thing goes down. Um, and then our roof does exactly that. And because we're trying to meet very high sustainability um, levels, it's a very heavily insulated roof. So historically, a lot of these cable net roofs just had a fabric on it or something that wasn't particularly heavily insulated. Um, some somewhere, but many aren't. So, but on ours, we've had to put this insulation. Also, the planners wanted to see a type of roof called an aluminium standing sea roof, which is basically a sheet of aluminium. Lots, lots of little panels of aluminium, and that system really doesn't like movement. So we've got a cable net that does move around a little bit, and then we've got. Um, so lots of insulation and then we've got this system on top that looks nice so Pete here did an awful lot of work of how this cable net would move with a whole series of articulated panels on top to make sure that none of those bad movements reflect through to the, the top surface 
Pete Winslow explains that there are two parts to solving this problem. Understanding how the cable net will move, and then isolating the fragile wooden ceiling panels and the aluminium standing seam roof from those movements. So I guess there's basically two, two parts to that process. One of them is actually um, modelling the whole structure in terms of the right stiffness properties and strength properties and figuring out how that's going to move. Um, and in structural engineering, we use a lot of finite element software, which is essentially a computer model which breaks down the structure into lots of small components, uh, and lots of small steel beam elements, lots of small cable elements, which we know very precisely what the stiffness of that small element would be. And then, of course, when you assemble them all together in the global model, um, you can't solve it by hand anymore. Mm. And um, it's a big computer model, and then um, computational solver, which will process through all that data you put in, all the loads you put in, all the stiffnesses you put in, all the material properties. And then um, that, and essentially the output of that from the computer model is the movements of your structure and of your roof. Um, and something like a, a cable net, which is, as I'm saying, a little bit like a tennis racket, um, stretched tight, you can imagine every little square between the cables moves in a different way when you have either wind applied or snow um, or different combinations of the two as well, or thermal effects. So there's, as I said, and again, to <laughs> construction it changed too. So yeah. you end up with um, sort of over a hundred different shapes that the roof might be taking. Oh, and so you were saying during the construction process, the roof will change shape. First of all, they, put the, well, they build the, the bowl around the outside. They then put the cable net on, which I say in three words, but it's actually a lot more than that. Mm. But then they put all these roof panels. So each, they, they, I tell you. yeah, the cable, the cables are three point six meters centers in each direction. So obviously there's a big hole in the middle. So then there's a timber panel that drops in into that hole that is supported by the cable. And as you put each one of those, it loads that cable up so that the cable will move by I think about half a meter in the middle as you put all those. And each one of those panels, ones that's already been installed, moves as you put the next one in, and that one moves as you put the next one in. And it always again when you put the insulation on top. Yeah. And then when you, um, was a, a little bit interesting thing is when you put the lights underneath, when you install them by pulling up on a pulley, of course that puts an extra load. Mm. And deform had a local deformation of your, of your roof, you've got to make sure the panels can cope with that. So, well, I guess all these are the, the different scenarios and different loading cases which cause different movements of the roof. So that's a whole chunk of analysis, essentially. Uh, once you know how the roof is going to move, or how the cables are going to move, I should say, you then have to figure out whether panels of a certain size are going to, how they will move and how they will fit onto the, onto the roof. So once Pete Winslow understood how the roof was going to move, his next job was how to isolate the solid timber panels and delicate standing seam roof from the movements from the cable net. The timber panels are attached to the metal clamps that hold the cables together at each crossing point. Pete and his colleagues solved the movement problem by designing an ingenious articulated joint sitting at each clamp that allows the cable net to move without crushing or cracking the timber panels. And to isolate the aluminium roof from the movement of the cable net, Pete had to carefully align these articulated joints, orientating these connections to make sure the movement only happened in the directions that the aluminium roof could cope with. So the idea is that the ceiling panels just sit on top of those cable net nodes. So if the cable net moves, then the, the timber panel doesn't get crushed or cracked or anything like that. Um, and actually the way you do that, you can imagine a square panel. In one corner you hold you, it fixed. You hold it fixed. Mm -hmm. In another corner you have a little sliding connection. Yeah. And the other two corners you essentially have oversized bolt holes. Oh, so they can just rattle around. The, 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 node, the four nodes that sit underneath mm -hmm. each corner of the panel can actually move a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's actually that. So a fixed on a slot and two oversized connections is exactly what you need to take out rigid body motion. So as I mentioned, it stops it rotating now. And had this sort of roof been built before, or had it, had it been built with these sorts of constraints before? C cable net roofs have been built before. I mean, particularly in Europe, they're not used in the UK, unfortunately. But there's no. It's one of those sort of confidence things that people just haven't built them over here. So there aren't many. But in Germany, they're you know they're, they're much more common. Um, there are fewer that have this rigid um, panelisation on top of it. But they exist. But, you know, you can go back to the seventies, and there are panels that have concrete panels. The key thing I think is new here that I'm not aware of elsewhere is this 
aluminium roof with very, very tight movement controls. But How do you isolate the movement from the ceiling? A lot of it is about careful alignment of your slotted holes and your fixed holes. Uh, in terms of the, the maths behind some of that, it's lots of spreadsheets, mm. lots of data from the mathematical models of movement, and then it's um, essentially uh, vector calculations, dot products, so you can work out how much movement occurs in certain directions, cross products, and that kind of thing. So when you look, it does turn out that uh, you go back to say, all that stuff you learn. Yeah, it does actually have some, some application. Because, and that's because you're essentially trying to model movement in 3D space, is yes, why exactly. you're using vectors. And, and sometimes in the middle of the roof, depending on where you are on the roof as well, the, the panels obviously inclined at different angles, mm. and also your aluminium standing seat roof at different angles. Um, and because the aluminium is obviously very, very long strips, you've got to make sure that the movement occurs in directions that the aluminium can cope with. Ah, uh, so if the aluminium's in long strips, then that means. What, that you don't want movement in direction of the strips, you want movement across them? Movement or? along the strip is alright. Movement along the strip is alright. But anything that kinks the strip. So oh, okay, it's, yeah. If it's a strip that it's like a little U shape that's been extruded, so 130 metres long, it doesn't, the way it's clipped to the um, structure below is movement along the length doesn't matter because the clip sort of slides along it, yeah. but any sideways kink. Because then so if, one, if, if, if this thing's going across a panel joint, and that panel decides to move that way, and that one decides to move that way. It's a bit like an earthquake, and it's sort of, you know, anything that's built across that fault line will seem yeah. snap. Yeah. So um, it's, I mean, in, in many ways, it's relatively simple mathematics, but it's the, it's the volume of, there's a thousand panels, mm. there's a hundred load cases, so each one has to be going through, and there's an interrelationship between one panel and its, its neighbours. And we're not aware of any other roof that's that level of analysis has been done on. It's perhaps surprising, given the pragmatic design concerns of optimising the experience of people using the velodrome, maximising the efficiency of the building, all within the constraints of the construction methods, the design process has led to a stunningly beautiful roof that almost echoes the shape of the track. Andrew Weir again. You do get a really nice relationship between the track and the banking and that, which wasn't, I mean, it's... It's a, a happy byproduct of the design. It wasn't. There's nothing intentional saying we want this shape to look like the track. So the curvature of the roof is actually almost opposite to the track. Is the opposite of the track? Yeah. yeah. It's really interesting. It sort of sounds like a whole lot of competing geometry problems and almost that optimization of, of the geometry yeah. and in the track itself, but then also the arrangement of the seating mm-hmm. and the roof and, and all those. I think one, one, one of the things I think the velodrome this building has been so successful is that in all buildings however good a team is whatever you, you always get some you know something good for structure is not good for architecture or not good for servicing I think this form all of us look at it and go well, that's actually pretty optimal for what we want so the architecture you know likes it for the architecture the service engineer looks at it it's fantastic it works for him in terms of many ways and for structure it works for us so and I think that's partly you know, it's, it's good design to be honest. It's getting the design right at the beginning, saying this is what we want to do, and maybe there's a little bit of luck in it. You don't know, you know, maybe this maybe this structure was really crying out for this form. We hope you enjoyed that interview from back in 2011 with Andrew Weir and Pete Winslow from Expedition Engineering, part of the design team along with Hopkins Architects of the London 2012 Velodrome. You can find out more in an article at plus.math.org where you can also explore more about the maths behind sporting success. Thanks for listening and enjoy the Commonwealth Games.